How many of you know a, a perfect family? Uh, you, know, you know what I mean by a perfect family. Um, one where the parents always make wise and loving decisions about their children. A family where all the decisions are welcomed unanimously by all those concerned. A family where the children are always well-mannered and, and courteous and obedient, and they undertake their household chores with joy. A family where parents are the closest of friends and the lines of communication are always wide open. And a family where all are sensitive and responsive to the needs of all the others under the roof. How many of you know families just like that? <laughs> That's kind of what I expected. <laughs> That's probably because they just don't exist. Families like that don't exist. Family relationships may be many things, but they are almost, well, they are, they are never perfect. There are many reasons there are no perfect families, but perhaps the biggest reason has to do with the two people who come together to begin a family. Uh, I, I, I saw a message just recently, and I thought this was, this was insightful. It says, the older I get, the more I realize no one has any idea what they're doing. I want to tell you, that's nowhere more true than in the area of parenting. Uh, God, in his wisdom, gives parents at least nine months to prepare. But when that child arrives, that's when the real education begins. Uh, and it continues through the years until we finally, as parents, get it, and that's when they leave home. We finally get so we know what we're doing, and they're gone. It's interesting, I, uh, I read uh, uh, just, just this week, uh, somebody had, had put together some statistics and said that over uh, a recent decade, there had been something like uh, 75,000 books published in the area of, of parenting. 75,000. Now, I'm going to try to uh, express the bulk of that this morning. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm just messing with you. You can. You know, it's despite our cluelessness, parents, fathers, and mothers are still the most important factor in the formation of children and going into adults. Thankfully for us parents, and I think mercifully for the kids that have to endure us. The New Testament has provided us with a cornucopia of direct parental counsel. And I've done an exhaustive search of the New Testament, and I've compiled a, this morning for us a, a comprehensive list of scriptures that lay out uh, this direct uh, 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 parental counsel for us. And uh, let's, let's take, some, let's take uh, some time now to go through this exhaustive list. Here we go. That's it. That's it. In Ephesians 6.1, Paul says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And he comes back to the subject again in the letter to Colossae and says, Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. That's it. <laughs> That's it in terms of, of direct parental counsel that you can find in the New Testament. It's interesting, considering how important the task of parenting actually is, it's surprising how little direct guidance we actually get from the New Testament. By the way, uh, you know, just a comment. Um, I, I think as we read those two passages, I, I just want to mention, I, I think that while the, the, those passages were addressed to fathers, I believe that they were intended by Paul to be words to parents generally. 
I don't think it was just something that, okay, well, dads, this is, this is, your, this is on you. I think it was a, it was a word to, to all parents. Paul is addressing both parents through the fathers in the household. So I'm not just focusing on fathers today. I'm talking about parenting and parents. It's interesting, you know, reading uh, all this, I, it reminds me of, uh, of one insight from a guy named Dave Barry, who, an insight he made about Father's Day. He notes how that the message of Mother's Day is mothers are amazingly good at mothering and they deserve a special day. The message of Father's Day is we're only doing this because we have a Mother's Day. Uh, now, I, I'm not quite that cynical, but, you know, I kind of... Mothers probably invest emotionally, certainly, uh, uh, their fair share into family life. It's interesting, though, that uh, uh, the Bible is not that cynical either. It's interesting how that as you, as you read around the whole area of, uh, of family, that modern studies uh, are consistently underscoring the fact that both a father and a mother are important to their children. Neither one or the other is, is more important. They both are important. Both are important because fathers and mothers each have a unique complementary role in, in their home. Uh, one family psychologist has noted how fathers, uh, in their role, encourage competition. They encourage independence and achievement. One person put it this way, dads play with their kids more dangerously. They're the ones that get down and rough with them, you know, and wrestle around with them. I, was, I, was, I should have put up a photo. I, I was thinking this week, we have a photo that uh, uh, when we were on holiday one time, and uh, Steph was young, and, and uh, I've, I've got her by the ankles, and we're going around like this, you know. And it struck me that uh, Cheryl would never have done that. <laughs> you know? Just the way, it's the way it is. That's, that's how dads roll, isn't it? You know, if you can't swing your kids around and make them dizzy so they can't stand, you know. That's dad's contribution. Whereas mothers encourage equity and security and collaboration. Again, in God's purposes, he, he's brought together a, a mother and a father to, uh, to express uh, a wholeness into the, and a completeness into the lives of their children. Well, we could go on at length about the importance of both parents to a child. That's why I think it, it seems puzzling to us, at least at first glance, that there's so little written about this important task in the New Testament. But actually, when we look at those verses that Paul just uh, laid before us, and when we reflect more deeply in what Paul writes in those passages, I think there is deeper truth there than first appears on the surface. There is, I think there's sufficient here to provide at least a godly framework for parenting. Yeah, Paul doesn't fill in all the particulars, but that's our job. But he does provide a framework for which I think we can, we can use to build upon to, as we think about being parents. And let's just look at that a little more closely. You think about those two texts from Ephesians 6 and Colossians 3. One of the primary things Paul does here is give us the primary purpose for every Christian parent. Now, again, I'll just back up a moment. When you, when you, particularly when you read uh, uh, in the book of Ephesians, Paul has began a long section where he says, don't no longer live like you used to. He's talking to Christian, to Christian households. He says, no longer live like you used to. But he said, be filled with the Spirit. 
And then, hey, then he begins to just elaborate the, some of the implications of that uh, uh, around husbands and wives, around children. He said, children obey. But then he comes to this, and, he, and, he's, and he's speaking to, to parents. And again, he's talking to people. He says, you have been filled with the Spirit. You're operating on a different level now than, than just uh, uh, your run-of-the-mill parent because you are connected to God through Christ by the empowering of his Spirit. And as, as he writes to such parents... He says one key task, if you will, the key task that you have as a parent is to raise your children in the, in the instruction of the Lord. Our key task is not to raise children who can function in society. Our key task is is not to raise children who can accumulate great wealth or great accomplishments. Our primary task as Christian parents is discipleship. And one of the things that, you know, I know Tony's been on about this, and I think we've talked about this before, but we just want to underscore this. Anything that we do around here, like for Kingdom Kids or other sort of programs like that, can only be a supplement. The first disciplers of all kids start with their parents and then also, I think, by extension, grandparents. We've got a lot of grandparents today here that are, that are, are, are also in that discipling process with their kids. One writer put it this way. Ultimately, your task as a parent is to nurture your children, not first towards, toward educational, financial, or vocational success, but rather toward Jesus Christ. That's Paul's insight as he calls parents to bring their children up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And that is the consistent call throughout Scripture. That as as parents who have been entrusted with young lives... Parents whom God has taken uh, uh, some, a very special part of creation and given us responsibility for. He says our primary task as Christian parents is to raise them up, to train them and instruct them in the Lord. And again, we find that message consistent throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. You look back at when God gave the Ten Commandments to Israel. Through Moses, he spoke in Deuteronomy 6, these very famous, well-known words. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In Scripture, the primary means of laying a foundation of faith and communicating the reality of God to a younger generation is parents teaching them, sharing the faith that they have known, teaching them what they have discovered about God, teaching them the truths of God into their young lives. You know, it's interesting. It's, we all love to hear harrowing testimonies of how God rescued somebody from the, the pits of despair and degradation, how somebody was just a, had an absolutely awful life and how that, uh, you know, they, they finally, in, in, it seems like at the last moment, God rescued them from such an awful pit. I like those kind of testimonies too. But I think God far more prefers stories like Timothy in the New Testament of whom Paul could write, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you. One generation, discipling the next, discipling the next. That's God's pattern. That's God's pattern. And here's the thing, my friends, we've talked about this before, but it's, but you know, and you know this, but... 
your children are going to be discipled by somebody. Somebody's going to disciple your kids. Our culture is going to, there's people in, your, in our culture that are queuing up to, 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 uh, to train and, and to incorporate certain values into your kids. If you don't do it, I promise you, somebody will. And you may not like the results. That's why it's, it, it, it's really important for us as, as parents to take this responsibility seriously. The torch of faith being passed from one generation to the next through parents bringing up their children in the instruction and the discipline of the Lord. You know, we as parents want so much for our children. We have so many dreams for our children, so many things that we do have to teach them and we want to see them accomplish. But at the bottom line, we should always remember Jesus' words. And he said, how does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? We as parents are the ones who begin the process of making sure, ensuring that they do not. Now again, I know that I, I, over the years I've seen, I've seen Christian parents in, invest great uh, effort into their children. They, they, they live the faith. They don't, and their children still walk away. I get that. I, I know it happens. This is not a, something that's automatic. But again, this is, it was one of those situa- this is one of those situations where, where we control what we can control. We do what we can do. There will come a time when our children will have to then accept responsibility for what they have received. Now, they might, do, they might just walk away from that. They might toss it away. But I want to be able to stand before God and say, God, I did my best in this regard. It may not have been perfect, but I tried. I invested in my kids that they might know you and might have the same love in their hearts that I do. I don't know. It may, sometimes that doesn't always click. But let's make sure that we do our part. Because again, at the end of the day, I think that's that's what God holds us responsible for. Not for the decisions that are made with that later on. Christian parents are to be disciplers, and that is a primary task. That is the primary task. But having said that, Paul lays down some guiding principles for that discipleship. It's interesting how in both passages, again, providing a framework, Paul uses the same word, but it gets translated a little bit differently uh, in different places, where he says, parents, don't exasperate your children. Or again in Colossians, parents, do not embitter your children. Now, we need to understand here, Paul is not saying, parents, never do anything that will upset your children. Never do anything that might get them angry at you. You know, if those of you had a little experience, you know that sometimes in those teen years, it seems that the very fact that you're alive and breathing makes them angry. You know, that it's just... (sighs) There will be times when you make decisions for their welfare that they will not understand, and they they will be outraged at you, they will be complaining how cruel and how unknowing that you are, how you can't see how this is going to just absolutely just destroy their lives. And they will be angry at you, and you, as a parent, you just have to wear that. After all, you've done a little more living. You've seen a few more things, and you're trying to protect them. Again, that's, that isn't what Paul is talking about here. When he says, do not exasperate or embitter your children, he's laying down a framework that says, don't let your parenting become so harsh or so smothering or at the other end, so apathetic and unattached 
that your, par- your, your child becomes embittered or discouraged or loses heart. Don't act in such a way that they end up feeling hopeless and beaten down. I remember learning a bit about this lesson. I think Erica was probably about 12 years old, and uh, it was my birthday. And uh, I finally got for my birthday something I really wanted. You know what I'm talking about, don't you, dads? <laughs> um, I, got, I got a brand new set of earphones. Now, at this stage of her life, Erica was known to not always take the greatest of care with things. And sure enough, first day, Erica manages to get a hold of my earphones and break them. Well, I lost it on her. I, I just could not believe that this could be happening. And I just, I, I just gave her both barrels. I just really, gave, you know, she was crushed. I could see it in her eyes. I could just see it. She went to her bedroom sobbing. And in a moment that I can only attribute to the Holy Spirit because my heart wasn't there, I knew I had to fix this. And I went in and I told her that, yes, I was disappointed because I really wanted those earphones. But I don't love the earphones, the headphones. I love you. And I forgive you, and this is going to pass. The point I make in in, in telling that story is I'd crossed the line in my reaction. And I could probably tell you a few others where I crossed the line. But I I had gone beyond discipline. I'd lashed out in a way that felt pretty good in the moment because I was so angry. But the problem was that in that lashing out, I had crushed her verbally. And I needed to undo what I had done. Lest the long-term fruit of that would be that she became embittered or discouraged or a whole host of other things that I didn't want to be in her life. Parents, I get it. You know, it's such a fine line that we tread with our children. It's such a fine line providing correction and discipline without crossing over that line. It's, it's, it's a tough call. And especially, as I said, most of us really don't know what we're doing. We're making it up as we go. We, you know, we get thrown into situations. You think, huh. So I understand. I get it. It's a a fine line that we tread. But some successful parents learn to be able to give correction and discipline without crossing that line that leaves children embittered and discouraged, deflated and broken. Well, there's a, there's, I could, there's so much I, more I can unpack around this today, but I'll finish with two observations. Not necessarily related to, well, yeah, they are. Never mind. <laughs> the first observation is, those of you who are parents will know what I'm talking about, and that is, kids mess with your heart. Kids mess with your heart. First of all, they mess with it by breaking it. It's hard to stand by and watch your kids screw up. See them do things that are contrary to everything that you put them in. That breaks your heart. Later, they break your heart when they leave home, get married, move to Cambodia. You know, <laughs> you know. Kids mess with your heart. but also they expand your heart. I remember a friend of mine in New Zealand saying, when his first child was born, 
his heart was so filled with love. He just, it just, he was just changed in such a great way. His heart was so full towards this young child that he said so much so that when his wife became pregnant, he did not know if his heart could actually contain another one. And he said that feeling lasted until the moment he laid eyes on his newborn daughter and his heart grew. Isn't it true? Kids mess with our hearts. But I think that's God's intention. I think God is, in, in, in doing that, he's teaching us how often we mess with his heart, both bad and good and how deep and rich his love is for us. Kids mess with your heart. Here's the second one. And it flows from Paul's first point. And that is, at the end of the day, my job as a parent is to model and represent my heavenly Father well. To represent to my children, something, however imperfectly, something of what the Heavenly Father is like. I had a, I had a great moment before uh, uh, Steph and John took off to Cambodia. Steph was telling me that they had this, uh, when, when they were down in Ballina at the school that they were at, they had this um, exercise they went through that uh, was kind of doing family history, and, and this particular uh, uh, section was about father wounds. And I thought, and she was telling me about this, and I thought, uh-oh, here it comes. <laughs> but she goes, I just, breezed, I just breezed through that because I didn't have any daddy issues. <laughs> well, partly I was going, yes, you know, I, just, <laughs> I thought that was. But, it, but I have to say it was deeper than that, seriously. Because I knew that However imperfectly I'd done this, I'd put no obstacle in her way to call God Father. Talk among yourselves while I compose myself. <laughs> Close with this. I think this could be a motto for every parent. It comes from 3 John. Now, I know all of you are, you know, intimately acquainted with 3 John. You read it regularly, and uh, you know, you, you'll, you'll know this verse straight away. 3 John 4. And appreciate as I share this, I know John's not writing about parenthood. I know that. He's talking about the congregation. But I think the words are so apt for, for parents. Third John 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my, that my children are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy. And Parents, you, you know what I'm talking about. No greater joy. You know, as parents, again, we, we, don't, we don't have a perfect track record. But we do have a perfect model. We sang earlier about our good, good father. That's a big bar to try to reach. It's a high standard to try to achieve, and none of us really get there. But we have before us a role, a role model that inspires us upward and calls us to be something like that with our kids. That just as we flourish under the watch care and provision and love of our Heavenly Father, that our children in turn will flourish and prosper under our care and stewardship. Let's pray.
Lord, we pray for ourselves today because so many of us here today have uh, responsibilities for children, grandchildren. And Lord, we want to, uh, we really want to make a good fist of it for their sake. Lord, continue to give us wisdom. Continue to uh, just remind us of what a privilege and what a responsibility it is to have these young lives in our lives. Thank you for the privilege of entrusting us with things, with ones that are so precious to you. Lord, we pray that through us they might find you. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I recently saw a, a, a great example of the power of a parent to, uh, to release good things into uh, 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 one of their children's lives. Uh, I don't know, some of you may have seen that uh, it was done by the ABC. They did a story on the transition that's happening at the Wayside Chapel in, in Sydney. And uh, one, former ch one Church of Christ guy was handing it over to another Church of Christ guy, interesting enough. And the, the, the one who's stepping in is a fellow named John Owen. And uh, they, they, John's a pretty remarkable sort of guy. But they showed him, uh, you know, at the induction service. And John told the story how that uh, afterwards his dad came up and just gave him a hug and said, I'm so proud of you. And John's pretty good. He, he was so touched by that, he said to his dad, well, you know, you can just die now. <laughs> You've done your work here. <laughs> and I get what he was saying. He'd done the job. He'd been faithful and built something into uh, his son that caused him to blossom into this great servant of the kingdom. Dads and mothers, never, never dismiss the power that you have to actually change the world through your children. May the Spirit of God just infuse you with wisdom and creativity that you can do that well. God bless you, my friends. Have a great Father's Day and a great week.